The Panzerjager Tiger P. Ferdinand is a legend. Thanks to its thick armor and its overwhelming firepower, it's regarded by many as the single greatest tank destroyer of World War II. But this praise isn't universal, and whispers of doubt surround this iconic behemoth. Some argue that this mighty machine's legend is entirely undeserved, and that in reality it was a very flawed vehicle of dubious quality. Today, we're going to investigate its history, both on and off the battlefield, to get to the bottom of this debate once and for all. This contract for the tank we would come to know as the Tiger demanded a vehicle with more firepower, thicker armor, and greater mobility than anything that yet had rolled out of Germany's factories. The top contenders for this contract were Porsche, Henschel, and Daimler-Benz. Ferdinand Porsche, a lauded engineer and founder of the company bearing his name, you might have heard of it, was particularly confident that he would secure the Tiger contract. His legendary engineering skills were certainly a good reason to be confident, but really, his confidence stemmed from his close friendship with Adolf Hitler, whose favor he had won by designing the Volkswagen Beetle. Interesting story. In anticipation of securing the Tiger contract, Porsche took it upon himself to produce a hundred hulls without any formal approval from the government. Unfortunately for Porsche, though, his hubris came back to haunt him as in 1942 the German military decided to award the Tiger contract to Henschel, as their design was just far simpler. Porsche had used a complicated hybrid drive system, like you actually find on a modern hybrid car, and no amount of nepotistic nudging from Hitler was ever going to make them warm up to it. This left Porsche with a hundred hulls that he had no customer for. Luckily for Porsche, however, the German military was hardly going to let good hulls go to waste, and so they decided to repurpose them for a new project, the Panzerjager Tiger P Ferdinand Tank Destroyer, which, for simplicity, because that's a massive mouthful, we're just going to refer to as the Ferdinand from now on. Ferdinand was to be a heavy, self-propelled gun. This is a tank without a turret, with up to 200mm of armor that utilized the new 88mm Pac-43 cannon, which was at that time the most powerful one available. There was good logic behind this choice. By that time, self-propelled guns had thoroughly proven their worth. Originally, these units had just been intended to engage infantry in bunkers, but the invasion of the Soviet Union changed this entirely, as a shortage of tanks forced them into the anti-armor role. They proved excellent. However, and so there was great optimism for the Ferdinand, a self-propelled gun built from the ground up as a tank hunter. But such a heavy self-propelled gun had not been done before. And so, to maximize the amount of experts with eyes on the project, responsibility for the Ferdinand's completion was divvied up between Altmark, Kiesch, Kettenwerk, Krupp, and Porsche. Now, you'd assume that this triumvirate of industrial giants would have been a match made in heaven, and yet we know that despite this, the Ferdinand is highly contentious. So, well, let's now delve into its combat performance to see just what makes it quite so controversial. All right, let's start by homing in on June of 1943, when the 656th Heavy Tank Destroyer Regiment, who happened to be equipped with Ferdinands, were deployed to the Eastern Front for Operation Citadel, the opening salvo of the Battle of Kursk. In preparation for the offensive, the 656th Regiment was transported to the Smievka train station, about 25 kilometers south of Orel, which served as their main base of operation. Now, once unloaded, the vehicles were driven to their assigned areas of assembly with the first company stationed at Kaliki, the second at Gostinovo, and the third at Davidovo. By the end of June, the regiment had reached their initial positions, and the days leading up to the offensive were spent training and allowing vehicle commanders to familiarize themselves with the terrain. Out of the three battalions, the first battalion was fully equipped with 45 vehicles, while the second battalion had 44, the third had 42. Although, do note here, this was a mix of vehicles, it wasn't all Ferdinands. Now, the 656th Regiment were chosen to spearhead the attack, supported by a remote controlled tank company equipped with Borg Ward 4s for clearing minefields. These compact vehicles, fitted with detachable explosive charges, were designed to detonate mines over a wide area and could be operated remotely or by a human driver, making them a sensible complement for the very large and therefore mine vulnerable beasts beside them. Having camouflaged their Ferdinands to avoid detection by Soviet aerial reconnaissance, the 1st Battalion managed to break 
break through the first line of Soviet defenses on the opening day of the attack, destroying 26 T-34 tanks and numerous anti-tank guns. However, the mines proved too numerous for the Borgwards to handle, and many Ferdinands were lost to them. The battalion lost 33 vehicles just to mines on the first day, and their recovery proved challenging, as at least five heavy half-tracks were needed to move one Ferdinand, and these often became targets for Soviet artillery fire. To make matters worse, the Soviet demolition teams seized the opportunity to destroy any abandoned Ferdinands that they could reach during the night. The second battalion faced similar difficulties as they advanced towards their objective. Despite the aid of their own Borgwards in establishing clear path through the minefields, the battalion still suffered a significant number of vehicle losses. But their situation wasn't as bad as the first battalion, as they lost many more Borgwards, but far less Ferdinands. But make no mistake, this wasn't exactly a victory. Uh, they'd gained really very little grounds, and they were still losing far too many of these cripplingly expensive vehicles. Heinz Guderian described the extent of the disaster that was unfolding in a memorandum dated the 17th of July 1943, and we'll quote it. The very heavy artillery barrage on the first day, 100 heavy and 172 light guns, 386 rocket launchers, and countless grenade launchers smashed the attack by our infantry. The Ferdinands and Stugs were not able to push their attack in the depths of the enemy positions as the infantry had been halted. Thus, the tanks had to stop in the middle of the battlefield, attracting concentrated artillery fire. The enemy artillery always found time to regroup and reinforce. The missing secondary armament on the tanks negatively affected the tanks in combat. Subsequently, losses were high. Guderian's testimony is a valuable resource for assessing the Ferdinands, but one could easily argue that it has its weaknesses. Guderian was a commander after all, and so was far away from the grisly business of combat. What we would really need to gain a full insight is the opinion of a Ferdinand crewman, and, well, luckily we have one. These are the words of Unteroffizier Bohm to General Major Hartmann, dated the 19th of July 1943, and we'll quote it again. On the first day of combat, we successfully defeated bunkers, infantry, artillery, and anti-tank positions. Our guns were under artillery barrages for three hours and still maintained their ability to fire. Several enemy tanks were destroyed during the first night and others fled. Artillery and anti-tank crews fled before our guns after we fired upon them repeatedly. In addition to many batteries, anti-tank guns, and bunkers, our battalion destroyed 120 tanks during the first round of fighting. We suffered 60 casualties during the first few days, mostly from mines. We also had bad luck. It was at the rail embankment when a Panzer III on the other side received a direct hit and flew through the air, landing on the front part of the Ferdinand, wrecking the tube, aiming device, and engine grating. We were more successful during the second operation defending east of Orel. Only two total losses. One Ferdinand under uh, Lieutenant Terrier to destroy 22 tanks in O1 engagements. The total number of tanks destroyed is high, and the Ferdinand contributed substantially to the defense, just as with the penetration. One gun commander destroyed seven of nine American-built tanks that approached him. The Ferdinand has proved itself. They were decisive here, and we cannot go against the mass of enemy tanks today without a weapon of this type. So Baum certainly had a more positive perception of the Ferdinand. I mean, sure, he concedes that there were issues, particularly when it came to the mines, but on the whole, he describes it as a formidable machine. All right, so then how do we come to an informed takeaway from such conflicted sources? Well, the thing is, we have to ask ourselves, why are they saying the things they're saying? Just because a source is contemporary doesn't mean it is either accurate or honest. Would Guderian, a promotion-hungry officer, be inclined to exaggerate or play down his woes? And similarly, would Baum, a promotion-hungry enlisted man, be inclined to oversell or undersell his actions? Naturally, the former has an interest in playing down how bad the situation is, while the latter would be more inclined to over-exaggerate. Ultimately, we don't know for sure, and, well, therein lies the skill of the historian. You have to decide for yourself. Now, look, with that said, Let's pick the Ferdinand's combat history back up on day four of Operation Citadel, when a group of four Ferdinands and 20 Tigers were advancing toward the Soviet line. On the opposing side, 12 Su-152s lay in ambush. Once the Germans reached a distance of 500 meters, the Soviet vehicles opened fire. Most of the Tigers were quickly knocked out, but the Ferdinands initially held steady. Eventually, however, they too fell victim to the Soviets after sustaining numerous hits at close range. The Germans lost all their Ferdinands in the encounter and didn't knock out a single Soviet tank. The Ferdinands' losses proved catastrophic, and three days later, on the 11th of July, 19 had been reported as complete losses, four of which had set themselves on fire, not even been destroyed as a consequence of enemy action. 
Additionally, another 40 had sustained minor damage and were out for repairs. On the 14th of July, further salvage operations were abandoned and the surviving vehicles were redirected to support German attempts to relieve the surrounded 36 Panzer Grenadier Division, which faced nearly 400 tanks of the Soviet Third Tank Army. Despite small German armor numbers, the Ferdinands appeared to have performed well in this action, destroying 22 Soviet tanks at a cost of only three themselves. Well, this sudden result, naturally, does spark a question. How come the Ferdinands were suddenly performing so well uh, when up until that point they appear to have been pretty lackluster at best? And the answer appears to be twofold. Firstly, there were less mines, and secondly, their commanders deployed them more intelligently. But whatever the reason, this winning streak didn't last long, as following this engagement, the Ferdinands participated in defensive operations south of Oral, where another issue came to the fore. And that was their reliability. Now, remember that hybrid drive system that won the Ferdinands the ire of the German military back in 1942? Well, it turns out that those concerns were well founded, as the strains of their continuous deployment were causing them to fail left and right. This is summarized by Oberstabsart Jorgenfeld, who stated the following in a report dated the 24th of July 1942. The regiment has been permanently in combat since the 5th of July. The Ferdinand suffered numerous technical problems. Initially, it was planned to withdraw the tanks for two to three three days after a four to five day commitment to undergo maintenance and repair work. This was not possible. All tanks now need an overhaul requiring 14 to 20 days. I herewith report to the Second Army that within a short time the regiment will no longer be combat ready. So this statement doesn't exactly push the scales further in the Ferdinand's favor. Eventually, however, the Ferdinand's time in the Soviet Union came to an end. Only a couple of weeks after the start of Operation Citadel, the surviving Ferdinands were withdrawn from the theater, with 42 having been destroyed and 23 requiring substantial repairs. Given the fact that only 100 had been produced, this certainly pushes our verdict towards being rather negative. But maybe looking at Operation Citadel isn't really fair to the Ferdinands. I mean, after all, any new tank would have major losses if it was immediately sent to a major engagement. Right? Well, this is certainly a fair consideration. So rather than judging the Ferdinands for this alone, let's see how it fared in some subsequent combat. In many ways, fate aligned perfectly for the Ferdinand to perform well in Italy. In part, this was because now it had been assigned to the 1st Paratroop Panzer Division, Hermann Goering, one of Germany's premier armoured units, but also because the Ferdinands had been upgraded since they were withdrawn from the Soviet Union. They were given a hull-mounted machine gun for close-range defence, a commander's cupola for enhanced visibility, and anti-magnetic mine paste, which is apparently a thing that exists. Given the criticisms that we saw about the tank in the last chapter, these seem to be a pretty sensible upgrade. So let's see how they worked out. The Ferdinands arrived in February 1944, where they were supposed to be the tip of the armored spear in the upcoming Fischfang offensive. From the outset, German commanders were not optimistic about its prospects, as the following telegram from High Command can attest. The Führer agrees to the 16th of February as time of attack. Unfavorable flying weather is absolutely necessary for the fixing of the definite date. Availability of all tanks is not necessary since a mass commitment of tanks is not possible. Tanks have to be held in the reserve. It is absolutely necessary to avoid heavy tank losses by manned fields, anti-tank ditches, or swampy terrain. We cannot afford such waste. Now, the attack commenced at 6.30 in the morning on the 16th of February. They were initially successful, quickly advancing a kilometer or so, but things quickly went wrong. Many of the Ferdinands found themselves either sideways in drainage ditches or immobilized in swampy terrain, where they were subsequently blown apart by naval artillery. A few of the Ferdinands did stick to the road, but well, this presented its own problems, funneling them into Allied defensive positions, where they were promptly knocked out one by one. This was an absolute disaster for the Ferdinands. Now, it's unclear how many were lost in this engagement, but the fact that they all but stopped being referred to after this probably gives us an indication of what happened to them. And so, with the story over, let's come back to the question that we posed at the beginning of this video. Was it a flop or was it fantastic? Now, the answer to that question is a bit of a tricky one, as the Ferdinand had both successes and failures in its record. In Operation Citadel, it achieved some initial success, breaking through the Soviet defenses and destroying many enemy assets. And if Unter Officer Bohm is to be believed, one-on-one, -on -one, it was a most terrifying weapon indeed. 
But equally, it would appear as though it was catastrophically vulnerable to mines and artillery. Its service in Italy uh, was only more dire. Once again, it showed a horrific vulnerability to artillery, and that time it didn't even manage to get in a few kills before being completely decimated. Compounding this is the reliability issues with its complex hybrid drive system, which at best simply rendered it inoperable, and at worst, destroyed it in a fireball. So where does this leave our final verdict? Personally, we think we can say that it was fine. A wonder weapon? Certainly not. But given its botched conception, it seems to have performed within reasonable parameters. Would the steel and labor used to construct them have been better used in other vehicles? Would it have performed better if it wasn't allowed to get bogged down and exposed to mines? Almost certainly, on both parts. But then, military blunders are as intrinsic to Nazism as anti-Semitism. So maybe this conclusion shouldn't exactly come as a surprise. But that's just our opinion here at Mega Projects. There's no such thing as objectivity in history, so if you disagree with our verdict, well, that's what the comments are for. Enjoy.